Yes, sir. We can start now. Yes, I am ready. Yeah. So, good evening to all of you. I am Shantanu Mukherjee, host for the evening. On behalf of Forest Firm, I welcome you all to this special online CME program. Today, we have gathered to have discussion on hemodynamics and clinical diagnosis of different types of heart failure. For presentation and discussion on the topic, I welcome our esteemed moderator and speaker for the day. We have with us Dr. Tom Devesaya, Professor and HOD of Asruba Medical College, Manipal. We have also with us Dr. V. S. Ramachandra, HOD Cardiology and Sri Sri Holistic Hospital, Hyderabad. And we have with us Dr. Rajesh Sri, Professor and HOD of Amrita and Institute and Medical Science of Ernakulam, Kochi. I am sure this unique platform where evidence means experience will help all to enrich their knowledge even during these COVID days. During the host of this program, let me brief the some important uh, aspect of this program. All participants, please keep their mic muted except the panelists. This is to avoid background noise. And if you have any question to ask, please use the chat option and send it to us and we shall present in front of the panel member for answering. You can send your question anytime during the presentation. So I welcome all of you and request Dr. Moder our moderator, Dr. Tom Debeshia, to take the proceeding further. Dr. Tom, please. Good evening and warm welcome to all of you. So we will have a short discussion on heart failure, hemodynamics, diagnosis and management. Heart failure is a major health issue especially in the cardiology world. And there is very high incidence of mortality and morbidity in patients with heart failure. It is very important that we diagnose, confirm the diagnosis, prognosticate, identify the high-risk individuals, and optimize therapy across all stages of heart failure so as to have optimal outcome. I welcome Professor Ramchandra to give his lecture on heart failure. Over to you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Ram. And Dr. Ramchandra, please. I think uh, he had some problem with connection. He got disconnected. Can you just connect to him once again? Sridhar, please give a call. Adil, please give a call to sir. Somebody else helping him, just a minute. Huh? Thank you. 
So he will be with us in a minute, just a minute. I'm <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Ram is here. Ah, welcome, sir. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you are uh, audible, but your screen is not visible, sir. Uh, please, please disconnect and share it again, sir. Uh, sir, I would request if you can switch on the video, switch off the video, so probably the network can get better. You can't see my this thing now. No, sir. It is started sharing, but we are yet to see the screen, sir. Again, you share the button, sir. Ah. First sharing, you have pressed. Second, again, you have to share it. Sir, again, yeah, yeah. Now you share again, sir. Am I visible now? Uh, still, uh, yet to be. Sir. Oh, your your screen is not being shared. So we will tell you once we can see that. So I I will log out and screen again. Uh, share again. Okay. So I would request if you can just hold on for a second. Are you put up your camera, sir? Maybe some connectivity will be there. More. Somebody paused my... Relog again. Yeah, please.
Yeah, now it has come, sir. Make it full, full screen, yeah. What do the presentation mode, sir? For make it full screen, yeah. That 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 is us, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah thank it you. Has come. Now it is clear, sir. Please start. Okay, okay. Yeah. So if sorry for the delay. You can switch off your camera, sir. Switch off. Yeah. Your voice will be visible and it will be more uh, clear, sir. I think there will be no issue. You mean stop video? Yeah, you can stop your video, sir. Bus. Now you continue, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is basically a presentation on uh, heart failure hemodynamics and how they help us in understanding the various treatments for heart failure. So basically, heart failure, uh, the definition of heart failure itself is a clinical definition. So it means that either the heart is not able to pump enough blood to maintain the cardiac output that is necessary at a particular point of time, which means say for a high output state, you know, the body might be needing more and it may, the heart may not be able to do it or it's able to do it at a higher cardiac filling pressures. So either the cardiac output is less or it needs higher cardiac filling pressures to maintain that sort of output. And basically, it is accompanied by a clinical syndrome consisting of a decreased effort uh, tolerance, uh, retention of fluid, and reduced longevity. And the basic problem is uh, an inability of the ventricle to fill or eject blood properly. So basically, this is a syndromic diagnosis where the problem uh, essentially lies with the heart, the preserved ejection fraction, where there are problems with the blood volume or the peripheral vascular resistance uh, or uh, the lungs or the kidney uh, that produce similar symptoms. So this is the AHA definition 2013. It has four categories, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which we all know, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which we are coming to know more and more over the last decade. Then there's a heart failure with uh, borderline ejection fraction, uh, which is now known according to the ESC guidelines as the mid-range uh, ejection fraction, which means around 40 to 50%. Uh, this uh, they have put because this seems to be a, a subset which is in between the previous two diagnoses. And there's a fourth category according to the AHA which is heart failure with project preserved ejection fraction that is improved. Now this is a very important uh, diagnosis because we have all seen uh, patients who have improved. And then either the doctor or the patient himself has stopped medications and then they come back after uh, a few months or years with a dilated left ventricle and this time you use the same medicines and it is not effective anymore. So basically <laughs> the heart doesn't give us many chances uh, to keep uh, its uh, volumes down and its ejection fraction improved. So this is a very important diagnosis. Now the ESC diagnosis uh, definitions which have come later have given more important to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. As you know, the diagnosis with re reduced ejection fraction is pretty easy because once you get these symptoms with a reduced ejection fraction, you would like to blame all of the symptoms on the reduced ejection fraction itself. But if there is mid-range ejection fraction or a preserved ejection fraction, you need two other things. One is you need elevated uh, natriuretic peptides, which tell us that there is congestion in the heart itself. And you need one additional criteria, either a structural abnormality of the heart, which is usually left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement, or diastolic dysfunction. Here again, echocardiography or any other imaging modality, or uh, hemodynamics, which means direct uh, pressure measurements of the end diastolic pressures or the atrial pressures. So one of these things you need. So basically, it needs uh, signs and symptoms. It needs... Uh, uh, ejection fraction, uh, which is normal in most cases. So therefore, it needs these two other things, either increased natriuretic uh, increase peptides and either structural heart disease or diastolic dysfunction in the heart. So the symptoms and signs of uh, low perfusion versus congestion are different and it's very important because all people do not have both the category of symptoms. 
So there are people who will have low perfusion, but hardly any symptoms of congestion, which makes the diagnosis quite difficult. And these people might just have fatigue and especially in old age, cold peripheries, some amount of confusion, tachycardia, mild hypotension, and a very important diagnosis is to measure uh, the venous oxygen saturation, uh, which tells us that the cardiac output has been reduced. So, you, so this is a very important test, just like you sense the arterial saturation. You can actually measure the saturation of the venous sample and get a good idea of the cardiac output has been reduced. And then, of course, we have these symptoms of congestions, which can be masked by uh, your treatment. So here again, uh, hepatic jugular reflux uh, is a very important uh, uh, maneuver as well as a square root sign, uh, a square wave response uh, to Valsalva as far as the blood pressure is concerned. And you can see as long as the patient is not being treated, uh, treated with diuretics, uh, usually people with uh, uh, symptoms uh, have uh, uh, these uh, signs uh, which are pretty e easy to elicitate and uh, which have reasonably good sensitivity and specificity. But the main problem nowadays is coming with people who hardly have any of these signs and symptoms and who may even have a normal uh, beta uh, BNP, uh, but have a lot of symptoms, especially with preserved ejection fraction. So that is the problem we are experiencing now. So if you want to look at the cardiac hemodynamics, uh, we have four components here. One is the heart itself, and the heart itself has these four components again, the preload, afterload, contractility, and the diastolic function. And then you have the peripheral uh, resistance, mm, and uh, which again has uh, three or four components. And then you have the other volume, uh, uh, the volume of uh, the blood the inside the uh, inside the circulation. And the fourth thing is, of course, the other organs, which could be the kidney or the uh, lung, usually. So these are the four components of. Uh, uh, of uh, heart failure, especially as far as uh, preserved ejection fraction is concerned. So we'll come to each one of them separately. Preload is the diastolic volume. So it is not essentially the pressure, but essentially the diastolic volume that will uh, determine how much of ratcheting is there between the actin and the myosin. So as the volume increases, you can see that the contractility seems to increase and the ejection fraction also might increase a bit but actually the stroke volume increases the ejection fraction rem remains similar and therefore the cardiac output increases as the lv and diastolic volume increases but then when the volume increases too much then there is a point at which it goes down so the ideal optimal uh, sarcomere length is around 2.2 microns and above which it might actually start stretching uh, and producing severe uh, LV dysfunction. So the preload is, uh, this is a pressure volume loop as we have talked in the previous series also. This is the end diastole and this is the isovolumetric uh, systole and then the heart ejects the blood, then the isovolumetric diastolic phase. So these two points, the end diastole and the end systole are fixed by these lines. Uh, and usually the pressure volume uh, volume loop, uh, even if you change the preload, afterload, contractility moves quite well within these two loops, which means it is not a very chaotic phenomenon. If you have these two loops, it seems to move between them. And that's why the pressure volume loops are very useful in, uh, in calculating a large number of indices. So as you can see, as the preload increases, the cardiac out, the stroke volume increases, but the ejection fraction which is the difference between the end diastolic and the end systolic volume sort of remains the same. The other thing that happens is as the end diastolic volume increases, it gets on the steeper part of the end diastolic pressure curve, which produces symptoms. So actually the Frank Starling mechanism is a basic compensatory mechanism, which is used by the heart. Whenever the LV ejection fraction decreases, it uses this phenomena of increasing the LV volume. At the, uh, at the expense of increased LV and diastolic pressures to maintain a reasonable cardiac output. The other thing that the preload does is it increases endastolic pressures 
and increases the wall stress also. So these two things have something to do with the afterload. So usually if the preload is increased, the afterload is also increased. So this is also very important to note that all the three factors somehow, you know, interact, keep interacting with each other. So this is what happens. The stroke volume is increased at the expense of increased end diastolic pressure. And uh, this, produce, this might produce a congestion, especially if the heart is failing. And the heart is failing, as you know, as the volume increases, the pressure increases quite drastically. So this is the Frank Stalling mechanism, as you know, as the ratcheting is fully opened up, if the heart stretches even more, then there is severe dysfunction and a very rapid uh, downfall when the heart seems to be stretching beyond its capacity. And this sometimes happens in the regional walls also after myocardial infarction. So this does not need to be a phenomena that is spread all throughout the heart, but it might happen in specific areas of the heart also, this sort of... Uh, uh, LV remodeling that uh, stretches uh, the heart beyond any possible ratcheting of the actin myosin filaments. So we have these nice hemodynamic studies and these things which are coming into use uh, in the uh, for patients also. This is called the precardia intermittent SVC balloon occlusion device. Uh, what it does is uh, it occludes the superior vena cava for five minutes and then opens it up for around five to ten seconds so that there is no clotting in the superior vena cava and this actually reduces the input into the right uh, atrium and the ventricle by 30 percent as you know 70 percent comes through the ivc 30 percent comes through the svc so it decreases the lv preload uh, the rv preload and thereby the lv preload by around 30 percent and what it does is it actually harnesses the frank starling curve as you can see what was here, which means it was on the downslope, it was beyond the proper rat setting, it brings it back to a position where the actin myosin elements can ratchet and then produce proper contraction. So these simple studies, th these uh, devices which use the simple hemodynamics that we need to know can make a huge difference. For example, in this precardia device, uh, by reducing the preload, they have not only increased the cardiac output, but also improved the diuresis drastically. As you can see here, it decreases the right atrial pressure, decreases the wedge pressure, increases the cardiac output. So actually decreasing the preload in these people uh, with uh, the LV dysfunction, severe uh, heart failure actually improves the cardiac output and also increases the urine output, most probably by increasing the cardiac output and also by decreasing the passive congestion of the kidney. So this is something that's also coming up in types of cardiorenal syndromes where if you reduce the passive congestion of the kidneys and improve the perfusion, if you can do both of them, then the urine output and the kidney function improves drastically. So this is a beautiful example of using uh, basic hemodynamics to improve uh, the ejection fraction and the cardiac output of a failing heart. The same thing can be used also for uh, tricuspid regurgitation where it produces increasing RV uh, loads, uh, endastic loads, and here also it's been found to be useful. Uh, and this can be nowadays be done percutaneously in some cases. So next we come to afterload. Now afterload is the pressure on the ventricle and the muscle has to generate to push the blood against the resistance of the blood pressure and against the blood against the resistance of the peripheral vasculature also. So it has basically these components, the arterial systolic blood pressure, uh, the peripheral resistance and the aortic resistance. So all of them are slightly different, although all of them look same. The systolic blood pressure is different from the peripheral resistance and is different from the aortic resistance. And as you can see, when the afterload increases, it reduces the ejection fraction. As you know, ejection fraction is the difference between the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume. So as the afterload increases, the ejection fraction is decreased. So ejection fraction is very much dependent on the afterload, unlike uh, uh, with preload, the ejection fraction does not uh, decrease or increase much. So rather than measuring the ejection fraction, we should be able to measure this end systolic pressure volume relationship or at least the end systolic uh, uh, volume relationships in these uh, settings where the preload or the afterload changes hugely. 
The other thing with the aortic lodi is that whenever there is left ventricular dilatation, uh, as per Laplace's law, as you know, that uh, the it is uh, uh, the pressure into the radius, uh, the stress on the muscle of the LV increases exponentially with the radius of the chamber. So as the chamber enlarges in dilated cardiomyopathy or in aortic regurgitation, the pressure increases tremendously inside the ventricle and thereby increases the afterload even if the blood pressure is not high. So the afterload is increased and if you can actually reduce the size of the chamber somehow, then the afterload will be decreased or the other way is to increase the thickness of the chamber. So this is what happens, there is compensatory hypertrophy in dilated cardiomyopathies and in other cardiomyopathies and also there is a, a compensatory hypertrophy in aortic regurgitation. As you know, the largest hearts uh, in valvular heart disease are present in aortic regurgitation and this is the reason. So this uh, increases the heart load. So the afterload also increases when the LV dilates after a myocardial infarction and after remodeling. And now there are percutaneous devices which can actually reduce the size of the chamber, either the aneurysmal size or actually the radius of the left ventricle. And these devices uh, are actually doing pretty well in the studies. And uh, they, they have already been approved to be used in some patients uh, on an experimental basis. So the afternoon load, like I said, is dependent on the wall stress, on the arterial pressure, and on the vascular resistance. So this resistance uh, can have uh, several components, um, uh, but these are the vascular resistance is an independent factor that increases the afternoon load. So when the afterload increases acutely, there is something called the ANRAP effect, which we have discussed previously. It is uh, increased uh, calcium loading of the heart that actually prevents acute dilatation. This ANRAP effect actually is present to some extent in chronic stages also, but it cannot fully compensate for the increased afterload that decreases the ejection fraction of the heart. And also when the afterload increases, the preload also increases slightly and this produces and increase the force velocity curve relationship. As you can see, the heart is contracting faster, although the, the velocity, the total velocity and total shortening remains the same. It contracts faster at higher preloads and thereby actually prevents the LV dilatation in these states of increased afterload. So what happens when the preload increases, it sort of limits the further increase of preload because of the force velocity curve. There are devices now, so we have, uh, as far as the treatment is concerned, uh, we, the treatment is mainly for heart failure is by decreasing the preload and by decreasing the afterload. So you have these balanced dilators like the ACE inhibitors or the ARDs uh, or combinations of uh, uh, nitrates uh, uh, like isolazin, uh, which can have both arterial and dilators. So you have these devices now. This is a aortic circulatory pump, which actually can be easily put within a few minutes inside the aorta and actually can be linked to an external power source. And uh, will uh, it can uh, uh, reverse severe cardiorenal syndromes in a couple of days by actually decreasing the afterload of the heart and increasing the perfusion to the kidneys. So this is used when a person comes and is quite sick because the mortality of acute decompensated heart failure in the hospital itself is around 30%. So if you can prevent these people from getting bad in the initial days, you can save quite a few lives. Now, as far as the afterload is concerned, like I said, there are very important ramifications of the blood pressure. It is not a simple measurement. You have the central aortic blood pressure, which is very important. When the compliance of the aorta goes down, the central aortic blood pressure might increase. And it is actually better to treat by the central aortic blood pressures because many times you might need to increase the blood pressure drugs or in some cases you they have been found to actually necessitate decrease in the blood pressure drugs also. So a good way is to check. So these are the peripheral blood pressures and these are the central blood pressures. So usually central blood pressures are lower than the peripheral blood pressures. 
and it's also important to look at the augmentation index the augmentation index is the actually the increased blood pressure because of the because of the uh, reflected waves that come from the periphery of the arteries so the augment the augmentation index is also very important when you treat blood pressures to prevent heart failure as you can see here are three patients here this person has a very increased augmentation index here it is less but it is more important to treat this patient than uh, this patient so blood pressure is not the only thing that needs to be treated we need to look at augmentation index central aortic blood pressure as well as peripheral vascular resistance and the pulse wave velocity uh, so these are the ways we can treat blood pressure more effectively because this is the commonest cause of heart failure the other thing that students uh, would need to know is something called the aortic elastance like you have the end systolic elastance uh, which is a independent marker of the lv contractility you also have the aortic elastance which uh, is just the opposite line here on the pressure volume so the aortic elastance also tells us if the aortic elastance increases uh, which means it is stiffer then there is an increased chance of uh, uh left ventricular dysfunction on clinical situation where uh, the aortic load is markedly increased is aortic stenosis so aortic stenosis may many times produce a severe reductions in the lv ejection fraction without a decrease in contractility so contractility is a measure which is independent of preload and afterload but ejection fraction decreases although the contractility is okay the ejection fraction decreases because of increased afterload in many patients with aortic stenosis so as long as you can document a good contractile reserve with dovitamin and then also document that the aortic valve is actually narrowed then despite low ejection fractions almost all of these people have a very good response to aortic valve replacement so as long uh, as soon as the increased afterload is taken off despite the low ejection fractions they do well aortic regurgitation is another valvular disease which has markedly increased afterloads mainly because of the increased systolic blood pressure as well as also due to the dilatation of the left ventricle so it tries to compensate that by increasing the thickness of the left ventricle <coughs> and here because uh, you know the volumes are important the way to know which patients need surgery rather than the ejection fraction is the volumes are important either end lv and end systolic volume is more than 50 mm uh, diameter is more than 50 mm if the ejection fraction is reduced or if the ejection fraction is okay the end aspect diameter needs to be around 60 or more so here again like i said anything that is dependent on the uh preload or afterload if something is uh, if there is a reduction in the afterload then you have to depend on the end systolic diameter if there is an increase in the afterload you might depend on the end diastolic diameter and this is what is happening with the aortic regurgitation another thing that is very important in aortic regurgitation is the heart rate if you reduce the heart rate the regurgitant fraction increases because of increased diastolic filling times and therefore you should not uh, use heart rate decreasing drugs in aortic regurgitation the reduction in afterload is found with mitral regurgitation and this again although the contractility is reducing the ejection fraction seems to be normal or increased so you have a, a a false sense of security looking at the ejection fraction because the although the contractility is reducing but the ejection fraction seems to be preserved because of a decrease in the afterload so here again you have to be very careful and uh, when the end systolic diameter is increasing because you are not able to actually ideally you should be able to look at the end systolic pressure volume because that is the indicator of the contractility but because you do not have pressures the other way to look at it is the end systolic diameter itself if the end systolic diameter is more than 40 or uh, 45 then you know that the patient especially if he has symptoms and severe mitral regurgitations you know that that mitral valve needs to be replaced the other thing is the secondary mitral regurgitation in uh, patients who have decreased ejection fraction previously in previous studies even the coapt devices the devices that were tethering uh, like uh, the mitral valve 
making it into a double orifice uh, opening uh, to decrease mitral regurgitation were not useful. And this was thought to be because of once you close this, uh, close this low output uh, ejection, uh, uh, the ejection fraction is bound to decrease. That was what was thought previously. But now uh, with the newer studies called COAPT, uh, this has been found to be very useful. So you have this classification now for the mitral valve uh, morphology, which is very easy on echocardiogram to make out. So basically the LV is dilated. Uh, it seems to be, leaflets seem to be coapting well. Uh, and there is a large central uh, mitral jet uh, with a large annulus. So this is what tells us that this is a secondary uh, mitral regurgitation because of LV dysfunction. So this is where you get the best results uh, through the mitra clip. So these are the results of the quad study. Uh, as you can see, markedly decreased mortality and almost a 50% uh, reduction in hospitalization in these patients. So basically, you need to treat these people before their LV size has increased more than 65, the, their LV and diastolic diameter before it has become more than 65 to 70 millimeters. And the people need to have severe mitral regurgitation. So even if the, the ejection fraction is not the criteria, the volumes are the criteria. So this, this is what, uh, again, if you go back to hemodynamics, uh, the ejection fraction is not a good uh, way to, uh, you know, check the contractility or even the other parameters in mitral regurgitation. So here again, uh, in the COAP study, they found that in contrast to the previous studies, as long as the LV is not hugely dilated, which means it is less than uh, 65 to 70 millimeters end diastolic, uh, and if there is severe regurgitation, these people do well uh, when you reduce the mitral regurgitation with the mitral clip. The third dimension is the contractility. Like I said, the contractility is best known not by the ejection fraction, but by the end systolic pressure volume relationship here. So the pressure in the end uh, and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is shown by the end diastolic pressure volume relationship and the contractility is shown by the end systolic pressure volume relationship. This is called end systolic elastance. And as you can see, as the contractility increases, the stroke volume increases. So the, 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 this is the uh, way contractility is increased by large number of drugs. As you know, the contractility is supposed to be independent of preload and afterload. Now we have a new drug uh, that actually increases contractility without increasing the myocardial oxygen demand. This is uh, uh, Omecamtiv, which is called OM. And nowadays, these drugs are being uh, called as, as you know, uh, there are three things, the calcitropes. Calcitropes are which are the inotropes that we have now. All of them increase the uh, intracellular calcium and also they increase the oxygen consumption of the heart. Then you have the myotropes. Uh, which is this drug and then the mitotropes which are which are actually acting on the mitochondria thereby increasing the energy that is available to the heart so if you use this classification uh, om is a drug that can be put as a myotrope so this is a direct cardios, cardiac myosin activator what it does is, is it increases the actin myosin bridging and it actually increases the duration of systole and the duration of overall active cross bridges and thereby increases the stroke volume and the ejection fraction without increasing the cardiac consumption of energy. So this is the best part of uh, these uh, drugs, unlike the calcitropes. So here you can see you have these large number of inotropes that we were using previously, all of them by different mechanism, increasing the intracellular calcium and thereby increasing the cardiac output but almost all of them increase mortality uh, because most probably because they increase the oxygen consumption by the ventricle. Then you have these drugs, uh, the myotropes. Uh, the OM is one of those drugs uh, that increases the ejection fraction and cardiac output, but actually does not increase the uh, 
uh, uh, oxygen consumption of the myocardium. And then you have the mitotropes which act on the mitochondria or the metabolism. A good example that is available to us is, is trimetazidine, which has a 2A or a 2B indication according to different guidelines for heart failure. It changes the fatty acid oxidation to glucose metabolism. And this also has some increase in cardiac output and ejection fraction without increasing the oxygen consumption of the heart. So this is what OM does. As you can see, it increases the systolic ejection periods and increases the uh, ejection fraction and also the stroke volume without increasing the oxygen consumption of the heart. And uh, this is a famous galactic uh, heart failure study that is being conducted and uh, uh, people are quite positive about this drug. There are other drugs also which uh, actually uh, can increase uh, cardiac contractility without increasing the oxygen demands. Uh, one of them is the soluble guanyl cyclase uh, stimulator. Uh, he, as we know, if you give nitrates, there is tolerance and uh, it may not get into the cell. If you use these phosphodiesterase uh, PDE5 inhibitors, which cause the decomposition of cyclic GMP, uh, as you know, the, uh, these also have not been very effective as far as reducing fibrosis, although we have some evidence that these drugs reduce uh, fibrosis. So this is a drug that actually directly uh, increases the soluble guanyl cyclase so that more cyclic GMP is produced. And this also has been found to improve uh, myocardial function slightly and more of other pleiotropic benefits are also being noted uh, with this drug called uh, very see what so this is a this is the uh, trial victoria trial which showed that it actually uh, although it did not significantly decrease mortality uh, it decreases hospitalization uh, significantly so if you look at this uh, drug in context uh, with uh, paradigm heart failure the uh, uh, sacubitril valsartan and the dapagliflozin as you know, it actually compares quite favorably with these drugs, uh, whether it's a relative reduction, uh, primary endpoints or the absolute uh, reduction also, and the number needed to treatment. It actually uh, compares quite favorably with these two drugs. So basically, what we want to tell here is any these are newer types of therapies that increase uh, the stroke volume and the ejection fraction without increasing the uh, oxygen consumption of the heart. And this happens, uh, for example, if you put a bioventricular pacemaker for a patient with LBB also, it increases the cardiac output, it increases the ejection fraction without increasing or actually decreasing the myocardial oxygen consumption. So the, these are new type of drugs rather than the calcitropic drugs that we have been using all along. Then comes the fourth component is, of course, the heart rate, which is a direct uh, determinant of the myocardial oxygen. See, if you look at these pressure volume curves, uh, this is the stroke work. And then the, 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 the gap between this uh, end systolic pressure volume and diastolic pressure volume and end systolic pressure volume curves is the potential energy. For example, if you decrease, if you increase the afterload, the curve will come somewhat like this. And then there is huge amount of potential energy that is being wasted by the heart to generate uh, power to counteract the increased pressure or the afterload, but actually less work being done. So this is how if you decrease the afterload, uh, more energy is saved uh, and the heart is able to increase the cardiac output and the stroke volume, but actually consume less energy. So it is very important to look at these curves to determine the total mechanical work on the heart. So these are the different loading conditions. As you can see, the main thing is if anything that reduces afterload uh, will bring this curve closer and will actually decrease the potential energy being wasted. But you have all these determinants, heart rate, contractility, and the LV mass also. So if you can decrease the LV mass, you can maintain a reasonably good cardiac output with the lesser uh, stress on contractility, lesser heart rate, then uh, whatever uh, the failing heart will still continue to tick for a longer time. So there are three major components of the myocardial oxygen uh, consumption. One is the basal metabolism, which means like any other tissue to keep itself alive. 
then the calcium cycling which is the amount of energy needed uh, for every every time there is a electrical impulse to the heart whether the heart contracts or not also for example if you have a device that totally rests the heart but the heart is still as electrical impulses then it will consume this and this surprisingly these two things actually are 50% of uh, the total oxygen uh, energy demand of the heart so actually 50% is going just to maintain some sort of basal metabolism and the other 50% is being used to produce external work so depending on the afterload as you increase afterload uh, the oxygen sub demand will increase as you can see here there is lesser effect with the preload as you can see these dots are nearer so afterload is more uh, dangerous than preload and then of course contractility if you increase the uh, contractility by the usual mechanisms of increasing the calcium cycling then the mvo2 will also increase and then a very important uh, consideration is the heart rates as you can see at uh, heart rates uh, as you increase the heart rates the myocardial oxygen consumption increases so th this is very important to note we come to the fourth component of uh, the mechanical properties of the heart which is diastole there are three components here compliance stiffness and capacitance so compliance is a diastolic uh, property which depends on where on the and diastolic pressure volume curve you are because when uh, at a lesser fillings uh, the, the heart is more compliant as the volume increases uh, the heart becomes less compliant so which means that when there is volume overload even slight changes uh, slight further changes in the preload or afterload might tilt the balance so this is very important so even slightly increased salt intake or water consumption in people who are already volume overload uh, can decrease compliance drastically which means the pressure increases inordinately compared to the volume and thereby might produce pulmonary edema capacitance is a much easier measure because it is a direct measurement of uh, the pressure uh, versus the volume uh, which means if the lv dilates like in remodeling the capacitance is increased which means it is able to hold more volume with less pressure so this is actually remodeling is a sort of compensatory phenomena where actually the capacitance is increased and the and the heart tries to harness this frank uh, frank stalling curve in the remaining portion of the viable myocardium and thereby increase this stroke volume uh, with a normal or a decreased ejection fraction so yeah, it tries to maintain the cardiac output lucidropy the active relaxation part is the isovolumetric relaxation part only so the rest of it is passive so the isovolumetric relaxation uh, part between the aortic uh, uh, closure and the mitral opening uh, is when the heart is actively uh, relaxing and detwisting and, and this is where the energy is needed and this increases as the heart rate increases it increases with the uh, beta agonist which means uh, the actually <coughs> and it increases with the ischemia so that as you know we ischemia produces the one of the first things that ischemia does even before producing pain is to produce lv diastolic dysfunction so that many people first experience dyspnea before they experience pain so before a regional wall motion abnormality starts and before pain starts uh, many people have diastolic dysfunction because of ischemia and this is a very early phenomena uh, that happens uh, because of lack of blood to produce this a uh, proper isovolumetric relaxation <clears throat> here again the heart rate is very important when the isovolumetric uh, this uh, uh, isovolumetric relaxation period is increased uh, then if the heart rate is also increased especially in cases of ischemia when the heart rate is increased the lv and diastolic volumes goes up significantly with a decrease in the stroke volume and this is the vicious cycle 
that happens in ischemia induced and decreased in cardiac output and in shock the other thing that determines the diastolic properties of the heart is pericardium so uh, even if the pericardium if the person does not have constrictive pericarditis the pericardium might contribute almost up to 30% of the diastolic properties of the heart and that is why in patients with lv dysfunction they have found that if you can uh, uh, if you can cut out the pericardium or at least release it at particular areas which can be done even percutaneously Uh, the increase in pulmonary capillary vent pressure with exercise or with fluid challenge or with leg raising is markedly decreased so this is a treatment modality that is being actively used uh, by several investigators where they can percutaneously make incision or remove part of the pericardium in people with the diastolic dysfunction uh, whether it is the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or decreased ejection fraction especially in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so now because we have discussed the diastolic function and the systolic functions we will come to the heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction this is basically a systemic disease uh, which leads to increased uh, blood volumes increased peripheral vascular resistance even if the blood pressures are not high the aortic compliance is reduced the peripheral resistance is increased Uh, and uh, thereby there is diastolic dysfunction of the heart which means that the heart filling pressures are increased uh, and the lv might be small and the cardiac output might also be reduced uh, despite the lv filling pressures being increased so what happens is as you can see here on the echo you have a large e and then there is a systolic longitudinal strain is reduced and actually not given in this diagram but the easiest and the best way to measure the diastolic dysfunction e is by measuring the e wave against the tissue doppler e uh, that is uh, very easy to measure it's called e by e so that is the easiest way to measure the active part of the relaxation when the heart unscrews itself uh, during the isovolumetric contraction so that is the period Uh, that is during that period or immediately after that when you get this echocardiographic representation on the tissue doppler that is very important then there is pulmonary hypertension there is rv dysfunction because of pulmonary hypertension left atrial dysfunction or left atrial size is increased and in some cases there is atrial fibrillation also so atrial fibrillation which should make a suspect a uh, diastolic dysfunction it is a a uh, very big uh, risk factor and indicator of vascular dysfunction and then you have uh, problems with the uh, vascular compliance uh, and increased pulse wave velocity and decreased uh, increased elastance uh, sorry decreased elastance of the aorta you have decreased diastolic blood flow uh, uh, decreased uh, blood flow in the peripheries and very peculiarly chronotopic incompetence also so this is something very peculiar people with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction have chronotropic incompetence which means when they exercise their heart rate does not increase properly thereby their cardiac output does not increase and they experience inordinate fatigue uh, when they exercise so this is something precipitated by exercise so these are the things that usually we uh, look for like uh, lv diastolic dysfunction left atrial enlargement lv hypertrophy elevated uh, pulmonary artery pressures secondary rv enlargement and of course lv enlargement also as indicator of increased lv and diastolic pressures so all these things can be noted in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction so the diagnosis is mainly by symptoms out of the symptoms like you know pnd is a very specific symptom and uh, like i said obesity and atrial fibrillation are great markers for uh, diastolic dysfunction now uh, if a person has atrial fibrillation you should automatically suspect diastolic dysfunction <clears throat> and uh, on uh, the echo you can see that the e is increased and uh, the e the tissue doppler e is actually reduced so that this gives a nice ratio so the e actually on the doppler e actually shows the lv pressures or the left atrial pressures or the lv and diastolic pressures whereas the e on the tissue doppler uh, shows you the active relaxation part of the 
uh, heart. So this is the best indicator of the diastolic dysfunction of the heart. So when you combine these two, it gives you a beautiful indicator uh, of the diastolic dysfunction of the heart that you can easily note on the echocardiogram. And of course, the increased uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressures, the left atrial enlargement and the reduced global longitudinal strain. So even before the ejection fraction decreases, the global longitudinal strain decreases and this is now available on many echocardiographic machines as automatic measurement. And then you have uh, these uh, markers, uh, but very peculiarly, they may not be quite sensitive, which means because in LV, uh, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, because the LV size is smaller, and the wall stress is decreased because of the cavity size as well as thicker walls, they may not generate uh, much uh, uh, natriuretic peptides. So, all the natriuretic peptides are a key, key or a sheet anchor for the diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction. Many patients who have symptoms of diastolic dysfunction do not have increased BNPs. Uh, and also many of them are obese. As you know, obese people have less BNPs. So this also is a confounder uh, for you to diagnose the, these uh, patients. And a very important part that is being repeatedly stressed nowadays is exercise testing in these people with symptoms. So if the symptoms are there and uh, you suspect, then you can make them exercise. Uh, to see uh, on a diagnostic cap that their wet pressure or the LA pressures go up or you can actually measure the RV systolic pressures also and document that they are going up. So by the, either by echocardiography or better by invasive monitoring, you have to do exercise testing to see to show that uh, the pulmonary wet pressures are going up or the RV systolic pressures are going up. So these are the, there are a lot of algorithms like this. Uh, this is the HEFPEF algorithm. If a person is heavy, hypertensive, fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, elderly, increased filling pressures, like I said, the Doppler measurement of the Doppler E versus the tissue Doppler E. Uh, all these things uh, are given points, and anything uh, more than five will tell us that this person has a, a diastolic dysfunction with a good sensitivity and specificity. So there are a number of algorithms like this, uh, like Schatzwas score. Uh, we can use these scores also uh, to give us to tell us what there is another thing called the FPEF score. So that can also be used. So once you suspect, uh, the best way to look is uh, by an echocardiography. There are two ways. Uh, like I discussed previously, the European Society says that uh, you need to have a clinical suspicion. You need to have some signs. And then uh, the BNP ideally should be elevated. But like I said, the BNP may not be elevated in some people. Then you need to look at some imaging modality to look for either LVH or left atrial enlargement or increase the right front systolic pressures. And then you, look, you can also look for markers of diastolic dysfunction. So the two markers of diastolic dysfunction are the yeah, a normal Doppler E, either tissue Doppler E, and if this is at the uh, at the you know mitral valve, uh, this thing junction, if you get more than fifteen, and the tricuspid vel velocity is more than three point four meters uh, per second, then of course you can uh, say with reasonable confidence that the patient has diastolic dysfunction. If the person does not have but has symptoms of dyspnea, then you need to. Make them exercise. Either do them by make them bicycle, do a bicycle ergometry or some other exercise and measure echocardiographically, or better still by invasive monitoring. So these are the invasive monitorings. If the person has symptoms but you are not able to document either uh, increased BNPs or increased uh, pressures in the heart, uh, means his uh, RV systolic pressures are not increased, his LV systolic uh, his filling pressures on echocardiogram or diastolic dysfunction parameters are not very clear, then you can put a pulmonary artery catheter and make them exercise and see that their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or the left atrial pressure goes up uh, significantly with exercise. So this is how it is done. Uh, uh, basically, I think uh, although we do not uh, do it uh, maybe we can start doing it because it is supposed to be a very safe uh, thing. Unlike the indwelling pulmonary catheters in patients in ICUs, 
these uh, temporary things uh, have not produced any problems. Uh, then coming to pulmonary hypertension in uh, diastolic dysfunction, it is uh, actually there are two types. One is the postcapillary and then the precapillary and postcapillary hypertension. Uh, so if a person has both, which means he has reactive pulmonary hypertension, not just a passive pulmonary hypertension, then it makes things worse. And many of these people might need some inhaled uh, drugs. Uh, inhaled uh, ni uh, nitrates like nitrate like drugs or they might uh, need uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors uh, to make them better so the, the, the depending on this you have these uh, three phenotypes one is just an exercise induced uh, diastolic dysfunction and then uh, the severe type is of course pulmonary hypertension and RV failure and in between you have this volume overloaded phenotype. So this one, the exercise induced one is the most difficult to diagnose. But uh, like we discussed, you can use the echocardiography and especially the exercise echocardiography uh, to make diagnosis easier. So the treatment depends on a lot of things, so we will not get into it. Amyloidosis is another very important uh, diagnosis that many of us miss. Uh, you should, especially in increasing age or with the family history, uh, if the person has a lot of dyspnea, conduction problems, low systolic blood pressure, uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, things like that, then you should suspect amyloidosis on the echo, it shows small LV cavity, increased wall thickness, sparkling myocardial, apical sparing. A tissue Doppler is hard to get, might be, there might be pericardial effusion and hepatic vein, uh, diastolic reversal uh, with uh, uh, inspiration. So unlike in constrictive pericarditis, there's hepatic vein, diastolic flow reversal with inspiration. And you can use uh, cardiac magnetic uh, resonance or you can use uh, pyrophosphate and in nucleus in technician pyrophosphate, a scintigraphy to diagnose cardiac amyloid. Because this is a very common disease with increasing age. It is said that above 80, almost 25% of people might have cardiac amyloidosis producing some amount of diastolic dysfunction. The other one, the other mimic is pulmonary artery hypertension. As you know, these are the five groups. Uh, the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, the left heart related, which is the one that we usually get in systolic dysfunction or in diastolic dysfunction of the heart. Uh, then there is the carpulmonary type of lung-related uh, problems, and then the chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension, and then multifactorial uh, reasons where it's not clear. So usually the diagnosis uh, is pretty easy. So we are all used to diagnose, uh, uh, you know, primary pulmonary hypertension as well as chronic thromboembolic uh, pulmonary hypertension, which uh, might, uh, uh, you know. Mm, present as uh, with symptoms of unexplained dyspnea. So the question is when to invasively monitor these people. Uh, so we have say a patient like this 61 years old the patient has orthopnea, bendopnea which means when bending they get dyspnea, occasional PND and uh, patient is obese uh, and uh, as you know there's the hepatojugular reflux like I said it's very important clinical sign of uh, uh, mild or uh, innocuous, I mean, uh, um, heart failure that is not very evident uh, through JVP. And everything else looks good except minimal pedal edema. So this is a typical uh, elderly female that we often see with breathlessness. And uh, as you can see, everything else looks normal, uh, including the pro BNP in some cases. Uh, basically, on the echocardiogram, what we look for is LVH, which is there, of course, and then the atrial uh, diameter. Uh, those uh, parameters, we need to put it in our echocardiographic room so that we get used to them. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the diastolic dysfunction, which is the Doppler E versus the tissue Doppler E. Uh, and we look at all these versus and the pulmonary artery hypertension also. And all of these could be normal, but when you exercise, you know, it makes a huge difference. As you can see, when the person exercises, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure shoots up. Uh, the pulmonary artery pressures itself shoot up uh, in spite of a decrease in the peripheral vascular resistance. So, which means that basically the problem is with the heart. 
and then you know that you have to treat them. So depending on the type of uh, uh, you know diastolic dysfunction disease, disease you can treat, uh, but they are basically according to these broad headings like the lung congestion, the chronotropic incompetence, some of them might need you to stop drugs that produce bradycardia, so this is very important. Then the pulmonary hypertension, some patients with reactive pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so this is post-capillary, there is one isolated post-capillary hypertension. So anybody with reactive pulmonary hypertension might benefit uh, by giving phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. And uh, for skeletal muscle weakness, which is a very integral part, you need proper exercise training. And atrial fibrillation, if you can control the rate or even better still, uh, you can cardiovert them. Uh, they do phenomenally well because, uh, as you know, the left atrium contributes 30% or more in these uh, half to the cardiac output in these patients with LV diastolic dysfunction. So this is again uh, showing you the importance of exercise uh, hemodynamics in patients with a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It shows that the pulmonary blood pressure shoots up with exercise and also with uh, leg raising and uh, uh, fluid uh, bolus challenge also. Just like you give it in constrictive pericarditis or restrictive cardiomyopathy, you can use the same test here also uh, to show that the person has uh, diastolic dysfunction. So as you can see, the specificity and sensitivity compared to the echo findings of E by E or BNP or the ESC algorithms increase when you do these invasive tests. So when do you do this easy invasive test? Many experts say that this should be done routinely. Whenever a person comes to you with, a, uh, with symptoms of unexplained dyspnea and you suspect that it could be because of um, LV diastolic dysfunction. The reason why is uh, many times when you give them a therapeutic challenge like diuretics, they may or may not respond. So you cannot use this as a test to tell you whether the symptoms are because of uh, diastolic dysfunction. So if, if you had a drug that was wonderfully working well, then you can use that drug and then, uh, then say that, okay, we gave this drug and he responded and that's why he, we think he has diastolic dysfunction as a cause of dyspnea. But because we do not have the drug, we need to do, do this invasive test. But may, I think many of us can try some small dose of diuretic before we do this invasive test. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, sir. Uh, over to Tom, Doctor. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Ramchandra, for the wonderful and exhaustive talk on heart failure. Because mostly it will be students who will be attending. I'll just uh, revise in short what he told. Heart failure diagnosis definition is very important. And the new concept of heart failure with mid range ejection fraction between EF of 40 to 49 is also very important. Please focus on that. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is a very important. Uh, uh, heart failure group which have almost uh, quite bad prognosis as the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction group. Heart failure diagnostic criteria, Framingham's criteria and the uh, national health and nutritional survey criteria is important. You need to go through them. The terms preload, afterload is very important. So also was Laplace law and NREP effect. The central aortic pressure measurement is very important and we need to have a focus on that. And I think we need to keep in mind the magic numbers in aortic regurgitation, the left ventricular and systolic dimension of more than 50, diastolic dimension of 65, and the mitral regurgitation patients with end systolic dimension of 40 are the magic numbers we have to keep in mind. The co-opt trial for mitral clip is going to be the future and management of mitral regurgitation with mitral clip is quite promising. The new myotrope drug Omicamtiv mecarbil is going to be a future promising drug. We are happy to use the mitotrope trimetacidine in our everyday practice. 
and so also other heart failure drugs like Arni and then SGLD2 inhibitors. Verisigvat has pro had some promise, but it's not being used currently. Diastole of the heart is very important as much as systole, and the key, key terms related to that includes compliance, stiffness, and capacitance. The isovolumetric relaxation is very important, and the key word would be lucitropy, which means active relaxation. The diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is at times difficult. However, echo diagnosis and echo observation of E by E prime and other factors, whether it is more than E by E prime more than 15 is also quite important as is equally important is TR velocity estimation and pulmonary hypertension. The word paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea refers to left-sided heart failure and patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction may have a BN NT pro BNP levels of only a few thousands, usually never crossing more than 10,000. The H2 FPEF score is quite useful for the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And cardiac magnetic resonance is a very good tool to assess patients with FPEF regarding etiology and sometimes the uh, enhancement during MRI uh, based on whether it is global, epicardial or mid-myocardial can sometimes help us to differentiate between these. Exercise hemodynamics are very important in very few cases who continue to be symptomatic, whose echo and nt pro levels at rest are not suggestive of FPEF or heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. And also etiological estimation of cause of heart failure with the mnemonic CHAMP, C for coronary, H for hypertension, A for arrhythmia, M for mechanical as in terms of ventricular septal rupture or mitral valve uh, rupture apparatus and P for pulmonary embolism are quite useful and very much important in the terms of prognosis and proper estimation. Other newer biomarkers like uh, um, uh, uh, in addition to nt pro -BNP and troponin, some other new biomarkers are available. However, they are not commonly used for clinical purpose. This would be in short, in just uh, the five minute gist of what extensive Professor Ramchandra taught. Please revise all these today itself or today and tomorrow. And any questions, if there, we would like to clear. Somebody asked if uh, nitrates and hydrolysin are a good uh, combination or they should be avoided in diastolic dysfunction. Okay, so combination of nitrates and hydrolysin is very good in the treatment of patients with heart failure and renal failure combination. However, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors has no role and should not be used. Also, the combination of phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors with nitrates sometimes are quite detrimental because they can produce profound hypotension. Hence, never use this combination together. So are beta I, blockers? Yeah, yes. are so mainly for diastolic dysfunction, there is hardly any treatment. So I think their main concern was uh, producing hypotension with nitrates in people with uh, small LV cavities and uh, LV diastolic dysfunction. So that is a very valid point and uh, Actually, apart from diuretics and maybe eplerinone or uh, spironolactone, nothing else has been seen to even reduce symptoms in diastolic dysfunction, not even heart rate reduction. Are beta blockers to be avoided in HEFPEF? So, well, well, please tell now. So, the problem with uh, this, like I said, is if the heart rates are high, you can use them. Uh, but you need to document that uh, the you know the LV diastolic pressures or the symptoms are actually going down because many of these people have like I said chronotropic incompetence and when you use beta blockers it makes things worse. So in patients with uh, heart FPF, the use of role of beta blocker is patients who have hypertension and tachycardia. That is in short what he said. Can we get the link of the recording? So I think uh, if there are no more questions, we can conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, in uh, preserved ejection fraction, heart failure. Uh, 
actually here again uh, we need to wait for those trials that are being done actually there are large number of trials being done with large number of drugs for bizarre dejection fraction including uh, sglt2 inhibitors also uh, but uh, arni has been found to decrease uh, bnps in uh, diastolic dysfunction so we will have to wait for these uh, larger studies to come uh, because uh, symptomatic improvement uh, with some quality of life questionnaire is uh, not exactly what we want we want some change in hemodynamics or increased uh, life span uh, with these drugs thank you yes sir let me conclude sir if there is no further question i think thank you good night to you all thank you yeah. sir just let me conclude sir yes we are now towards concluding this wonderful program and i must say this it was an exciting program which has enabled us to gain from the wisdom and the expertise of the speakers and panelists i take this opportunity to thank dr tom debeshia dr b s ramachandran and obviously dr Ta rajesh t for great contrib uh, contribution in making this program possible and successful i am thankful to all participant who have ta taken time out of their busy schedule to attend this program and i thank all of you for making this event successful and i sincerely hope your support will remain with torrent in times to come thank you goodbye and good night to all sir especially thanks to dr ram as well as dr ram chandran as well as dr rajesh ji sir good night right sir good night sir good night sir yeah rahul adu adil are you there sir yeah this uh, dr uh, gaurav pande dr vidya sir right has asked for the this one the uh, recording sir recording. yes yes sir yes yes sir you know coordinate with all managers of the okay. yes sir definitely sir. yeah dr rajesh thank you very much and dr rajesh thank you very much sir is not okay thank you good night good night sir